I absolutely love uh, hardy bulbs. I think they're totally underused in gardens. Um, and they're something that uh, once you do use hardy bulbs, you just never go back. Um, I think what turns some people off is they start with the wrong things. You know, you see those beautiful tulips. And I've often said to Jack DeVruman that, you know, I wish you wouldn't stress the tulips so much. I mean, this is beautiful. It's eye candy. It's like, look at all those colors. However, how many of you have chipmunks? Squirrels. How many of you have squirrels? How many of you have deer? Rabbits. Right? Like just about everybody in this audience. Guess what? All of them love tulips. They love them either under the ground. Exactly. It's like you're just planting them for them. You're, you're just like setting them up for the winter. Um, deer will eat the flowers just as they're emerging. It's like um, I did a garden one time. I used to have a, a garden business and I did perennials and herb gardens. And we, uh, one of the, let's just say, one of the big department store people, the Marshall Fields, their house in Lake Forest had this long, beautiful driveway that goes back out on, but it goes out onto the open lands in Lake Forest. So the deer are just, so she was having, I don't know if it was, I can't remember if it was a wedding or something. So she wanted like on either side of the driveway, like a, a thousand tulips on each side for this special occasion. And I really tried to talk her out of it, but that's what she really wanted. She goes, wait, the dogs, you know, she had all these dogs. The dogs will keep the deer away from up there. Well, two or three days before the event, all of the tulips were perfect. They are showing their color. Just about ready to just boo, right on time for the event. The deer came through and all there was out there were these green stems. They left the stalk. You know, it's just that. So that's why. Um, Unless you have, uh, you know, want that splash to put into a container, we'll talk about this a little bit. I don't dislike tulips, I love them, but you need to use them sparingly. So, um, guess what? There are bulbs that critters won't eat. Daffodils. You ever wonder why you go around a garden and you see daffodils that come back? You go by old homesteads where there were, you see daffodils out there still. It's because they're in the amaryllis family Anything in the amaryllis family has a little toxin that's inside that bulb, also inside the leaf and the flower. So nothing's going to eat it. They're, they might taste it, but it gives this kind of a crystal, makes it really icky in their mouth, and they will leave it alone. So you can plant daffodils like crazy. Um, so anyway, we're going to kind of talk about some of these different things because I think what happens people plant tulips They get discouraged because they get eaten and so then they give up on bulbs um, But this is just a way to kind of see some of the varieties We are mainly going to be talking about some of these ones on the inside bottom uh, Right in a minute so we can hone in on there the alliums Kenodoxas galanthus some of those are what we're going to and then of course daffodils so other really good sources I find are books. I'm a book person. Good old Roy's book. You know, he talks a lot about grids and snaking things through. We're going to talk a little bit about that on how to incorporate bulbs. Um, I love books. So another great book is The Art of Gardening, written by Bill Thomas from Chanticleer. Anybody be, been to Chanticleer Gardens in Pennsylvania? Put it on your bucket list. Mm -hmm. I think, I have to say the Chicago Botanic Garden, of course, is my favorite because um, I'm being recorded. But <laughs> probably my absolute in the United States that I've been to, and I haven't been, of course, to not that many, but um, is Chanticleer Garden outside of Pennsylvania, uh, outside of Philadelphia, north of Philadelphia. If you ever are in that neck of the woods, Oh my gosh, it's a breathtaking garden. So um, you can see here, alliums right on the front cover. And you perusing some of these kind of books gives you ideas of how to incorporate bulbs in kind of more unusual and innovative ways. Okay. Um, cut flowers. People don't think about bulbs that much for cut flowers, but they're wonderful cut flowers. This is an old book that I love by Lee Bailey, Country Flowers. It's by month so it's telling you what's blooming the first week of April and then how to you know what bulbs you can use then in your garden magazines this is 
Gardens Illustrated, which comes out of the UK. But it is an absolutely stunning gardening magazine. You know, most of our gardening magazines have kind of gone by the wayside. They tried to bring back garden design for a short while, but um, they tried to do it without any ads and it failed. Uh, now it's strictly online. But gardening magazines uh, like this are a wonderful way to expand your plant horizon. It uh, gives great current information, shows you um, just you know, wonderful illustrations, how to use bulbs, how to use other plants. So uh, this is a wonderful. And they actually uh, featured Roy's book in it um, when his book came out which was, they don't do much from the States. This is a book that's in Dutch, um, but uh, Jacqueline van der Kloot is a, a really well-known expert in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, she did come and help consult with uh, some of the gardens here, like Lurie Garden and some of the others. Um, but you can just take a look at this book if you wish. But I mean, look at the color combinations, um, pink and orange and red. You know, I mean, just looking through here, just some of her um, combinations. So, you know, you don't really need to understand the words. You can see the photos. And that's what's brilliant about botanic names because the botanic name is the same whether it's in England, the Netherlands, Japan, if they're always Narcissus floroplano. You know, it's gonna be Narcissus floroplano here, Japan, wherever, okay? So that's, that's what's brilliant about our, the botany system. Two more and then I'll go from there. Okay, Christopher Lloyd from Great Dixter. I had the great pleasure of going to Great Dixter and Fergus Garrett, their head gardener now. Um, this, it was the home of Christopher Lloyd um, and he, wonderful garden writer. And Fergus has been here to see Northwind when um, he came to the garden to talk for us and we stopped here to see Roy and we bopped around and then we went up to Ulbrick and he gave a talk up there. But Christopher Lloyd, again, just uses of color. Um, so look at this, these are bulbs. Uh, again, it's by color, but you can see how he uses them uh, throughout a garden. Look at that with the purple and orange, you know, so I can't stress enough, just expanding your gardening horizons. And then this was my absolute first bulb book. Did anybody back then have the time life Gardening series? I still am. Right? I mean, when I was probably 20, 21, and just starting to work at Cinesfet, uh, we sold this whole series, and I have all of them still. I, I can't bear to part with them. You know, I really don't use them that much anymore, but I, every time I go to Purge, and I think, oh, they're my first books. So, you know, still incredibly useful, especially for beginning uh, bulb gardeners. You know, it talks about the different physiology of bulbs. It talks about, you know, all the different types. So you can pick up these Time Life Gardening Series books. Um, uh, just, again, Powell's other places. But even though they're very dated, there's something about botany and horticulture. That information is, a lot of it stays pretty much the same. Another thing before we get into the bulbs themselves are tools. So to me, the most useful tools, um, if you're, especially if you're digging individual holes, this is one of my favorite shovels. I got it from Smith, Smith & Hawken umpteen years ago. Um, somebody said that they call them something for rabbits. And I thought, what? They're, they're to dig out rabbit bur uh, burrows or something. And I'm thinking, <laughs> to me, it's just a perennial. It's wonderful for perennials when you don't need, you're trying to go in between other plants and you don't want to disturb everything else. It's just a very useful tool, but I always like having a T-handle, and I like having some place to put your boot to, to be able to stomp that in. Okay, so that's a great... Now, this one I got at Great Dixter. You can actually get these online, and I think there's a company now that makes them here. But this is, again, you can be on your hands and knees, and you it's almost like rowing, you know? You can just... Go like this and pull out, and it's, I use, you can see how much, this is a very well-loved tool. I mean, that is so handy uh, for perennials, for annuals, for, and especially, and then bulbs, yeah. I don't know what you would call this. Um, sometimes they call them dibbles, but that's the short one. 
But if you, if you Google Great Dixter, they do have a shop. And, um, but, and they, you can order them um, that way. And I, there's, a, there's a Dutch company that makes something similar now. I would just say a short perennial spade. And then if you are digging holes, you know, how about just a good old trowel? Yeah. Most of your bulbs, you're only going to go down the depth of a trowel. Yeah. Some of them maybe a more. So this gives you an idea um, of how deep you have to go. Plus it's got a nice curve to it. It scoops out a lot of soil. If the soil is really bad, there's nothing better than a Japanese knife, soil knife. Heavy duty. Um, it's got a very pointy end. It's got this serrated edge on the side. So if you're trying to go through turf or roots, you just can dig around and it's like a, uh, the serration on the side. And then this side is a sharp blade. So this is when, or you're digging your hole and you hit a rock and you need to, this isn't going to cut it. You can use this to get in there and get, get the rock out. But these are just wonderful. Okay. This comes with a little pouch that you can put on your belt or stick, you know, so it's, oh, you can always have it with you. And again, you can see how well loved uh, this is. So just a little bit of background and, and support stuff for bulbs. Now, um, again, we talked a little bit about tulips. We talked a little bit about daffodils, but I would say that how you use bulbs to me is, is really what makes it fun. Um, I think too many times you see bulbs planted like in a corporate office and they will put in like 2,000 yellow tulips and yes it looks fantastic but then they are gone and then um, you know you you come in with something else somebody says well I don't I don't have I don't want to do that I don't want to have I don't have a space that big so to me you're you're threading them through a landscape if anybody has been here in spring and if you walk through Roy's garden, you walk through the uh, Cecilaria and you'll see allium sprinkled through them, little alliums. Or you might sprinkle a short little daffodil through them. You don't have to only put them like an annual. You don't need to just put them around your mailbox or your light post or in a row in front of your house. Okay, sometimes you see that where they've planted like 20 tulips and they're like little soldiers okay so use them like you would a ground cover or a perennial but thinking about it being short term this is a spring enhancement okay one of the things i i often talk about is okay here we've got this big beautiful hosta so let's say you've got a clump of hosta in your garden now if you're a gardener like me I am so anxious to see something happening. When it gets to be April, every evening I might have my glass of wine and I'm walking around seeing something has got to be coming up. Yep. You know, yep. there's got to be something here. So if you have to wait for this hosta to emerge and fill out that spot, what, do you, what would you say? End of May? End of May, early June. Right, end of May. There's a lot of nice weather It's happening before end of May. So. What you can do is if you've got this hosta and you know you have another one here and another one here, take and plant something like muscari, grape hyacinths. It's a little bulb, easy peasy to grow. It only grows maybe six inches tall, five, six inches tall. You just sprinkle them in clumps around. And when I say in clumps, I might dig one hole this big and the rule of thumb, let's say this bulb is about an inch big. So you plant it three inches deep. The rule of thumb is three times the, the size of the bulb. Plant it deep, okay? Um, I always go maybe a little deeper just to be on the safe side, especially with the way our winters are now. We're having milder winters. Um, and that's fine except for when we get a mild spell, things thaw out, and then it freezes hard again. Okay, so you want a little more insulation. So I've been kind of telling people now maybe four times the size of the bulb just to be on the safe side. So you, you, and I like to put them out. So if I've got my bed here, 
I will go and lay out five. I'll just put a, a group of five bulbs here, three here, six over here, four over here, three over here, and then a scattering of ones far out. Because most of the time, when you think of a mature planting of something, there's a heavy concentration where the mom and dad plants are, right? And then seeds get spit out, or birds take some seeds over here, and so then you get these random ones off to the edges of it. Okay, so that's why it's kind of nice to do that random. In, in, uh, in, in the UK, when they're planting daffodils in a field, what they do is they put them in a bucket or a big, and they pitch it. You know, they, they go like this and let the bulbs fly and they plant them where they lay. It gives you a random planting. Okay, you just have to make, throw them, sure, throw them up and let them, yeah. <laughs> now you just make sure you try to get them all in the ground. Um, you might miss the next spring, you're going to find one over here and go, oh, he, I missed that one. <clears throat> so then what happens when spring arrives, it becomes April, early May. Up come your muscaris. They bloom. They're glorious. You have something to look at. Uh, when you're walking around, you're happy. The bees are happy. You get those early, early bees that come by and are like, oh my gosh, there's something here for me to eat in April. I don't have to wait for the hosta blooms in July. And then they will start to fade. The green stays there. Don't cut them back. They will allow, they will spit seeds around. They will make more bulbs under the ground and it will multiply. And then by the time the hosta emerges, they're going dormant. You don't have, because people say, well, don't they need sun? By the time that hosta covers them up, they're already dormant. They've done their whole life cycle. And they're now dormant under the ground. That foliage that was there has built energy back into the bulb and uh, it's ready to go for the next year. Now, one little fun tip about a muscari. Um, has, has anybody ever planted something really special that's, that stays dormant and fall comes around and you slice right through it? Like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you know, like you have lilies, let's say, some big, yeah. beautiful lilies, and you see this little hole in the garden, you go, oh, I can plant something there, I got a hole. And you take your nice sharp spade and you cut right through those lilies. It just kills you, you know? So, if you plant muscari around that patch of lilies, what's cool about muscari is that they are eager beavers and they wanna get a jump on the next year. They will send up foliage. Right now, if you go out into the gardens, you'll see muscari, grape hyacinth and foliage coming up. So if you plant them around your very special underground things, you'll say, aha, I see that little fairy circle. There's something good there. I don't need to dig in that spot. Okay, so it's really kind of a fun little, we call them marker, marker plants, marker bulbs. So, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but you know, here's a daffodil bulb. The thing that's beauteous about bulbs is that it's like instant ramen right here. You just add water and some soil and it, it's gonna grow. Yes. Everything is in here. You cannot do anything wrong except plant it too shallow, too deep, or where it's wet. Hi there, you don't wanna eat this. Because one thing bulbs cannot take is sitting in water. So, uh, but they will grow just about anywhere so you can't plant them too shallow, too deep, or, um, yeah, there's a chair tier too. Um, and, um, but that's the thing. Because see, here's the root system. You can see last year's roots. Here's the bulb. This is, these are last year's leaf stalk. So you plant this in the ground. Okay, this guy is about two inches. So I would plant him eight inches down, okay? Dig your hole, set them in there. Um, you do not need to put anything. Don't put fertilizer in the bottom of the hole. The roots start growing. They don't want to hit fertilizer and burn. Okay. Now, do you think, what happens if you buy these and you don't get them in the garden? Can you plant them next spring? If they haven't sprouted. No. Leave them normal. Anybody ever buy an onion and leave it in your pantry too long? An onion is a bulb. What happens to the onion that's sitting in your pantry for three months? It dries up. It just desiccates. The tissues desiccate and dry up. And why? It's because it has been dug up. This bulb needs to 
go in the ground. It's got the moisture of the soil around it. What's it going to do um, in November after you've planted it? You think it's just going to sit there? What's cool, that is going to grow roots. If you plant this bulb today, it's going to start growing a root system. If you dug this up a month from now after you plant it, you'd be amazed how many roots are down there. So it's going to grow roots all the way through November until that soil freezes. So by spring, it's got a massive root system under here, which will then, when the soil warms up from sunshine season hitting it, it will push out those leaves and bloom. So it's instant. Everything's here. If you cut this open, you can see the leaves. You can see where the flower is. It's a little instant package <laughs> ready to go. That's why they're fun for kids, too. You know, you show a kid this and say, well, it doesn't look like it's a flower. How can that be a flower? And then you plant it, and they're so excited because, wow, look what it's made. So the trick is, if you buy bulbs, get them in the ground. If you can't plant them for whatever reason, at least put them in pots and put them in your unheated garage and water them once a month and then move them out because then at least they can grow their root systems. Okay, it's, it happens all the time. You know, people buy them and they don't get them in and, and so the, just at least put them in some soil um, and they'll be fine. Now the only things you don't have to do that with are like some of the paper whites or the amaryllis, the indoor bulbs that you get, because those are tropical bulbs. They don't really need to have a cold season. These bulbs need the cold. They need that long dormant time to grow roots, and then their little circadian rhythm is as soon as that soil warms up and they've got moisture, up they come. So it's very, very cool. So that's, that's what the, the bit magic of, of different bulbs. Um, now, there's all kinds of things you can do. It doesn't have to be muscaris. There's all kinds of little bulbs. There's Scylla sibiricas. You'll see them on the sheet. There's, we have this little one here called Pushkinia, which is a little squill, beautiful white with a blue stripe. You could sprinkle these in amongst your perennials. It doesn't have to be hostas. It could be sprinkling them in with any of your other perennial plantings. Daylilies and daffodils are a wonderful combination because your daffodils come up. Sometimes when I would put daffodils or um, things in my garden designs, people would say, oh, I don't want to put bulbs because then you have all those messy leaves to contend with. Um, and you do have to leave the foliage up because it's going to supply energy back to the bulb. Um, for the next year. So if you keep cutting off the foliage, the bulb will go downhill because it's not getting energy back. Okay, but at least you can then, if you plant daylilies, uh, daffodils with all your daylilies, by the time the daffodil foliage is starting to look kind of yucky, your daylilies have come and totally cover it up. All right. So that, it's a brilliant way to put those bulbs in with other perennials that are going to then hide that fading foliage. As soon as the foliage turns yellow, you can remove it. Yeah. Do you have any favorite daylilies that you like combining with daffodils? There's so many daylilies. Oh, there's so many daylilies and there's so many daffodils. True. It's really whatever you like. I love Hyperion. It's an old daylily. It's a pure yellow. Mm -hmm. She's nodding her head. She knows it too. And it has a lemony, lovely fragrance. But there are so many wonderful, uh, we sell one called Chicago Patchy, which is a brilliant deep red. Um, there's just so many. And you can put whatever daffodil really that you like. Daffodils come primarily in yellows, whites. Some have an, a pinky cup, some have an orange cup. Um, but those are your color combinations. I love white daffodils. Um, uh, I think it's just something different. Um, I love um, small cup daffodils. Uh, this is a small cup daffodil. And you're probably saying, what's a small cup? There are, believe it or not, 12 different divisions of Narcissus. All daffodils are Narcissus. Okay, it's just like um, you have a Chevrolet and you've got, oh, I'm, I'm, this is bad, like what, what, Camaro and Impala and... Um, <laughs> Bolt, you know, so there's all these different types of Chevrolet. Well, all daffodils are narcissus. Even jonquils, people say, aren't da daffodils and jonquils the same? Well, a jonquil is a type of daffodil, but not all daffodils are jonquils. 
okay? You'll see in the book here, there's one that's called Narcissus jonquia, or the jonquils. Jonquils are a smaller daffodil, multiple flowers per stem, usually very fragrant. Um, so even within daffodils, there's the huge trumpet daffodils, the big yellow ones, Dutch master, the ones you see. There's large cup daffodils, and all it means is you know, you've got the back part of the petal, and then you've got that trumpet that comes out, the cup. So on a trumpet, that's, the trumpet is as big and as long as these petals in the back. A large cup, the petals are a little shorter on the cup. And a small cup, they're, they're very small, but to me, they look much more natural. So you can kind of see on the photo here, if you look close, that the cup is really tiny, mm -hmm. okay? So it's just, to me, a little more natural looking. So if you're adding it to perennial gardens, um, it kind of, to me, blends in a little nicer. Then there's miniature daffodils. There's um, double daffodils. They have a double row of petals. So they're very fluffy. Uh, there's some that have um, a split corona. So if you go look at daffodils, you'd be amazed at how many different types there are. Height, size, all of that. Miniatures are wonderful to snake through uh, low perennials and ground covers if you don't want something really big uh, in there. So again, even within daffodils, you can have so much fun. If that's all you do is daffodils, you can have a riot. Um, but then, yeah, so there's all of these small bulbs that you can use um, to do that kind of sprinkling through. Um, irises, who knew? They're, I love irises because there's so many different types of iris. There's bearded irises that, you know, like in our grandmother's gardens, there's Siberian irises in our perennial gardens, very narrow foliage, a uh, little flat top, Japanese iris, which bloom in wet areas, um, blue flag, which is one of our native irises. There's also a bulb type of iris. So this comes up very short in the spring, um, has that typical iris flower with the standards, which are the three petals that go up, and then the falls, which are the ones that hang down and you get some wonderful, and these spread and really make beautiful clumps, and then they'll fade away when your other perennials are blooming. So it gives you this beautiful true blue bolt right in that time frame of, of like early to mid spring when you need something fun to look at, okay? So irises are fun. Um, there's, this is probably the first thing to bloom. Yeah. Yeah, how do you plant the iris? Same way, you're gonna plant them about four times the size of the bulb, which is about an inch, four inches deep. I would put them in a clump. Most of the time, you don't want to just put onesies or twosies of these. You need to have a mass, you know, a little bit of a grouping to have it work. Um, I'll never forget, and I didn't want to make this person feel bad, but when, when I ran the garden center, Cinesvet, we had this huge bulb display, and I had a woman come up, and she had taken a bag, and one of the little slips and one bulb for like maybe 50 different things. And oh I mean, some of these things are gonna be a plant this big. And, and I said, well, maybe you should get a few of each kind. She goes, well, I just wanna try it. And I'm thinking, well, for 24 cents, I think I would have bought maybe 10 at least. Mm -hmm. I said, you're gonna need a magnifying glass to go out there and find that one little cyc cyclical that I put in. But, um, but she really just, wanted to try. And so to me, it's going to be, you know, she really should have had 10 or 20 of each one. Yeah. So when you plant those, do you put the point down or up? Oh, that's a good question. So point up or down. Now some bulbs don't have points, but let's talk about ones that do. The staffodil, pointy end, right? Yep. Up. Here's the root system. So yeah, you would put that up. Okay. You can sometimes see on the bulb, this is called the basal plate where all those roots are coming out kind of tells you that that's where the roots come. But bulbs are really forgiving things. If I planted this thing like this, okay, because there are some bulbs, I dig a hole. I literally, my dad uh, had a bag that he used to keep with golf balls. And he would go out and just go pew, pew, and hit all these balls. And then he'd go out and throw them back in his bag. So I have his bag now. He's passed away quite a while ago but I use it for bulbs. So I fill this satchel full of bulbs and I'll pitch them and then plant them where I may. And sometimes I do not worry about which way. I will dig the hole from up here 
if I'm planting bulbs in the lawn, I'll take my nice handy thing, go like this, pull it back. I've ripped up the soil and the turf a little bit. I throw a few little bulbs in there, stomp it down and go to the next hole. Now, why is that gonna work? Because this bulb is very smart. It wants to survive. So if, it's, if I plant it this way, or when I throw it in that hole and it lands this way, what happens is as those roots start to grow, the roots know, I gotta go this way. And it'll, root, the roots will come and they'll grow this way and they will turn the bulb the way they're supposed to be. So they're, they are, they will survive. People proof. People proof, thank you. <laughs> you, know, you mentioned for the irises, but that, you wouldn't plant all irises eight inches deep, the other kind, not, not the bulb kind, right? No, the a perennial bulb. Yeah, so a perennial iris, like a Siberian iris, you would plant that like you would other, your other perennials, you know, hostas and things. But these guys are little bulbs, okay? You can kind of see they're about an inch. Um, and so these would, you would put them in the ground about, you know, five, six, eight inches deep. And again, maybe put three in a clump over here and sprinkle them in around. Don't put them in a row. Think about Mother Nature. Um, and... Um, and I mean, it's all fun to try. If you've got a small grouping of hostas, just plant something and try it. And if you really, really like it, uh, you can get more. Yeah. Are those deer resistant? Yes. Oh, okay, good. I would say the main things that deer go for are crocuses, and so, so do the squirrels, I should say, too, and tulips. They're the, they're the ones that are really eaten the most, crocuses and tulips. So as much as I love tulips, I put those in pots. Okay, except for, and I'll remind me to get to the little tulips, but, um, but yeah, these guys, the, the deer won't bother and um, you just want to do a nice, a small clump of them. Now, what's nice, always make sure you keep the name of what you planted because what's happened with me many times, I plant a section, I really love it, but then the next spring I go, oh, I should really have taken this another two feet over here. So if you know what the name of it is, this particular one is Iris Blue Hill. That is a true name, I mean, that is a name. There's, there's probably 40 different types of irises. Now when you get to daffodils, oh my gosh, and tulips. So if you write down the name, I did this three years ago at a garden. I planted um, Narcissus Barrett Browning, which is one of my faves. It's a small cup with an, it's white with an orange cup. And I really needed another five, six feet to come around this curve and end the, the garden nicely. Because I knew it was Barrett Browning, I took a photograph, so I knew that I needed to start at, let's say, this aster, Devaricatus, and I needed to go over to this, because when fall comes around, uh, you know, you go, well, I think I'm one of them here. So if you take a photo, or I have a journal where I just make a drawing and I'll say, I need about 50 bulbs, I need to put it from here to here to here. And then you can look and say, ah, boom, boom, boom. And you can add those 50 bulbs, okay? The other thing, and I know I'm going all over the place here, but I truly believe in a garden journal for that very reason. I keep a journal because when spring happens, that's when you walk around your garden, right? And you think, oh, I really would love to have some daffodils here with these hostas. Now, when fall rose comes around, are you going to remember that? No. Are you going to remember that you wanted to put a white narcissus here by these hostas and how many I need? So in spring, you walk around your garden, either in the morning with a cup of coffee or in the evening with a nice glass of wine or a rye and ginger or something, and you make notes. And you say, oh my gosh, this is prime spot for um, putting in a whole bunch of grape hyacinths in amongst this ground cover. I think I need about 200. This is where I want to plant them. And you make those notes. Then when you walk into a garden center, you walk into the fall bulb festival at Chicago Botanic Garden and you see all of these bulbs and you have no idea what to, to buy, you can take your little journal and you can say, ah, here's a nice white daffodil with orange cup. I need 50 of them. Boom. You know what, you know? It's like going in, in, to the grocery store without having a recipe in mind. 
and you just kind of wander. So that's why having a journal. Now you're always going to have that spontaneous purchase where you see this gorgeous, you know, um, whatever, daffodil or something that you say, oh, I just have to try this. Well, oh, I mean, we all do that. But at least if you have your shopping list, you, you're good. Yeah. Um, I have a question. When you do your tulip bulbs in a pot, uh -huh. do you plant them in the fall or in the spring? You have to do them in the fall. And then you keep them outside or you bring them inside? Good question. So you can only plant bulbs. They're only available in the fall. So what I do is take my tulips, and there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, you know, like if you have extra nursery pots, okay, you've planted this. Now you've got that extra pot that you don't know what to do with. Save those. They've got drainage. They've got drainage holes. You can plant maybe, um, you know, maybe five tulips in that pot. You put a little bit of soil in the bottom. You put the five bulbs in the bottom and then fill the rest with soil. I, several things you can do. You can put it into a, maybe your vegetable garden. Do you have a, if you have a vegetable garden that you can sink them into and then maybe put a little bit of landscape fabric over the top or chicken wire so that the critters can't dig through and eat the bulbs. Or if you've got an unheated garage, put them along the wall of an unheated garage uh, not up against the wall that fa if you if it's attached to the house that part's heated put it along a different wall and again you might need to put some uh, mothballs or something to try to keep mice from wanting to dig in there um, but that works if you've got an ancient refrigerator that you could keep it like you know you know a low temperature you can put them into a refridge a window well works really well because what you want to do is maintain a constant temperature. You don't want the temperature to fluctuate. And then you just bring them out in March, end of March, depending on the spring, uh, and then away they go. Now what I do is water them once a month. The first, uh, first day of the month, so I remember, oh, it's March, it's uh, February 1st. You go out and just give them a little bit of water. And why? What were we talking about? You're trying to grow roots. So if you leave them in a bone dry soil, they're not going to grow roots. They're, it's, or if they do grow roots, they're hitting dry soil and the roots will desiccate. So once a month, just go out and give them, you don't have to soak them. You're just giving them enough moisture so it gets down through that soil. So that's kind of how I do it. And then what do you do with that pot? Are you going to take okay. Pot and, yeah. So good. So we, from there, A, you can either, let's say I want to put them in this container. So I've got this container on my front porch and I have a couple of other spring things in it. I can then take that pot of tulips, keep them right in the pot, sink them in. And what I do is when I'm planting that spring container, I take one of those same size nursery pots, sit it in there and plant around it. So then the hole is there. I just slip the pot of tulips right into that pot. Then you're not trying to dig something out and try to find room. You could also take them mm -hmm. and actually plant them in the garden. In the pot. Uh, in the either, pot. either in the pot or take them out. Okay. Um, you know, one time at the Botanic Garden, we had a, a terrible situation where we were, th this one part was, gonna be, was supposed to be planted, it was for the um, Antique and Garden Fair. They didn't get this one section planted. So right at the entrance where this new entrance for this event was gonna happen, there was nothing there to really entice people. So that's what they did. Um, they planted a whole bunch of things in pots. When the weather was nice enough, they went out, took them out of the pots and planted it just like they were planting uh, impatience, you know? And they got them all planted and they bloomed and everything was hunky-dory. So that's how you do container, yeah. Oh, you guys are like perfect. They're like asking the perfect <laughs> follow-up questions. No. So why is that, do you think? Um, another reason why tulips are not very good in our region is that, you know, if you see a tulip bulb, it looks slightly different than this. It's, it's, it's kind of that shape, still has the root. But what happens with a daffodil, see if I can find one, Daffodils get better and better. See how this bulb has made this little baby on the side? 
they call that a DN1 or a, a, um, a double nose. So it's got two noses, so two growing tips. So it makes more and more side shoots. The, the daffodil gets better and better and better. And as a side note, don't break this off when you're planting. People think, oh, I'm just going to break all these little sides off and spread them around. No, don't do that, please. Because there's no, you can see here, it doesn't have much of a basal plate. There's not much of a place for roots to grow from this little side yet. It's still a baby attached at the hip. And also, if you break that open, you've left a wound and critters, bugs are going to get in there. So plant the whole thing. Two or three years from now, you can divide this, but don't do it now. But anyway, back to, what was I talking about? The tulips. Tulips, thank you. Maybe the hardiness. Hardiness. What happens with a tulip? Our weather is not conducive for tulips. So instead of getting better and better, putting out new side shoots, plus they're not getting eaten by deer or critters, the tulip instead of will split. And if you dig up a tulip like t two years later, it's a bunch of shards. It's almost like little slivers. Have you ever planted a bunch of tulips? They're beautiful the first year. The second year, they're kind of okay. By the third year, you get a few leaves and you get a few small flowers. That's because the bulb under the ground is starting to break apart. They don't like our hot summers. They don't like our weather. That's why they grow much better like in Seattle. Um, they do fine in, of course, the Netherlands. But our weather, our soils, are not conducive to tulips. Uh, if, raise your hand if you didn't get a handout, the white paper handout, and Chloe's going to fix you up. Um, so that's why tulips also are not, to me, I treat them as annuals. Some of them will last two or three years. Some of the ones especially that are not super hybridized. You know, if you look in this brochure, um, You'll see some tulips that are really big and they're double and they're huge and they're fluffy. Well, the more fancy they are, the more that they've been bred, the weaker they will be. You treat those really like an annual. Um, I know um, one year I planted angeliques. I love them. They're beautiful. They were left over. But I know that the second year they're not going to look anything like that. So we had a new neighbor. I, we keep having new neighbors next door. I, I, I don't think it's me. Um, but. This one neighbor looked and she says, because I was pulling them all out. They'd finished blooming. I know they're not going to look good next year. So I was just pulling them out, bulb and all. And she came, Jenny came by and she goes, what are you doing? Those were so beautiful. I said, yeah, but they won't be next year. What do you mean? So I know that I, I really want that to look like that. I will plant those angelique tulips again the next year. I treat them as annuals. Okay, but daffodils, better and better and better and better. Yeah. Is there something between the, the little um, perennial tulips and the big fancy, something like maybe Darwin, is that a in between? Yes. Or? Okay, so just as I was saying that there are 12 different types of daffodils, there are also, I think, is it 14 divisions of tulips. And again, when you look in your brochure, there's Darwin tulips, there's Fosterianas, there's Kaufmannianas, there's Gregii, there's lily flowering, there's um, Split Corona. There's, there's just many, many different types. My friend here was talking about that there are some tulips that really will perennialize. Um, and uh, I hoped to have had some today, but I can, I, I'm going to try to get some. Tulip Atarda is literally a tulip that's about this big. I think it might be one of your books. It, it's about this tall. Yeah. It has a beautiful yellow and white flower. It opens and closes with the sun. And it comes back. For whatever reason, the critters seem to leave them alone. It's a teeny tiny bulb compared to the big ones. You can plant those and scatter them in your perennial gardens. Um, they are absolutely wonderful. There's also one called Tulipa linifolia, which is really thin stem, a little red and white uh, small tulip. These are diminutive. These are not the big in-your-face tulips that we're talking about that you're thinking of. These are very small. They're called species tulips, meaning they have not been, you can go up in Turkey and find them growing naturally. So they're, they've not been hybridized. Uh, there's several others. There's uh, Baker Eye Lilac Wonder. So all of these sweet little uh, short little tulips. Um, 
are wonderful and they will perennialize. Now, Darwin hybrids are your typical uh, cottage tulip, I want to say. They're the ones you think of with the kind of the goblet. They're the classic long stem, sturdy, beautiful tulip. They are also quite hardy for whatever reason. They will come back many years in the garden if you can protect them from that first year. Now deer is another story. The deer will still eat the flowers. But I have fooled Mother Nature and the squirrels a couple of times when I've wanted to really have either some tulips. Um, there was one client that really wanted some crocus because she remembered as a little girl her grandmother showing her the crocus. So she wanted crocus to show her grandkids. So we planted them um, and this one time with these tulips, I planted them in the garden and then I took some chicken wire, like one inch gauge chicken wire. And before I put the final soil back over the top, you know, I dug the hole, planted the tulips or the crocus, put some soil, and then I laid this chicken wire over the top and back filled in. So the, chip, the squirrels literally were hitting the chicken wire. The bulb was able to grow through it. They didn't eat the flowers. I didn't, this, we didn't have deer in this situation. It was really just the squirrels. So there are some ways, and if you can get them to be rooted in even one year that the squirrels haven't dug them up, what's happened now to that bulb? It's growing a whole bunch of roots, right? So now the second year, if that squirrel wants to dig up that tulip, he can't because it's anchored into the ground. So if you can just get those tulips or crocuses in for one season by doing whatever means possible, um, you can sometimes have that little planting. There's also the other ones that are sort of good for a medium size is the Kaufmannianas or the Greggiis. Did you get one of these? Yeah. Wait, Let me get the big one. So there are Tulipa, Kaufmanniana. Yes. I was trying to see what page they're on. They're on page 19 of this bigger book. Kaufmannianas are kind of a mid-size. They're only maybe 8 to 10 inches tall. Um, they have a, a pretty little mottled foliage, some of them, in the Greggii. And it's a shorter little tulip. They call them border tulips. They will sometimes come back year after year. Okay, okay so that's another good one. But um, the more fancy, the parrots, the doubles, the... Yeah, yes, those um, are probably not going to stay. So, um, shade. We have some people talk about, well, I've got quite a bit of shade, and it's shade of a building or shade of evergreens. Um, there is snowdrops. Um, snowdrops will take shade, and what's lovely is this pu beautiful pure white. Because it's dark and shady, the pure white will just pop. You know, if you plant like Scylla sabirica, which will also take some shade, it's a blue. From a distance, though, blue in shade just recedes. You really don't see it, where white from a distance will pop. So I love snowdrops. Can't have too many snowdrops. They're one of the first things to bloom in the spring. Beautiful little upside down nodding little flowers, and these will spread. Critters will not eat them. Um, absolutely wonderful. Just plant them up. They're wonderful. Um, there are a couple of different types of bulbs that are not really a bulb, but it's more, they call, it's like a little corm or, or, or a tuberous root. This little winter aconite is one of the first things to bloom in the garden. Okay, Eranthus hyamalus and winter aconite. These are sometimes blooming late February. You know, if you've got a, there you go. So beautiful through the snow. Uh, beautiful little yellow buttercup flower. They have a really interesting little ruff of leaves right under the base of the flower. I mean, yes, they're teeny tiny. These will send seeds around. They will, it's really will spread and make a nice carpet. But it's a little tuberous root. If you look at this, for lack of better words, it looks like a rabbit pellet that's dried up. So now, and the same thing with a little plant called anemone blanda, which I think is on page, it's right here, um, 43 in your bigger catalog. Anemone blandas are another wonderful little bulb to sprinkle in low among things. But they have this really hard, dried up 
little tuberous root. Um, and a lot of times people that buy them say they never came up for me. And I can almost tell you why. Because this is so hard and dry, if you plant this in the garden and, we, and you don't water them in, or if we don't get rain and that soil stays dry, this stays dry and it never makes any roots. So I, you can almost guarantee that you can go over there, dig them up, and they're sitting there just like they were. And, and that's why they didn't grow. So what you want to do with these, these and the anemone blend, is you want to soak them in a bucket of water overnight. They almost, they won't quite double, but you can tell the difference that it absorbs that moisture, it softens up that, um, that sh kind of skin that's on it, and it'll allow those roots to, to come through and grow. So what that also is going to lead me to tell you is that you've got to water the bulbs in. You know, somebody will say, well, they're not growing. It's just this thing. Why would I need to water it? A, you want the roots to grow. And B, okay, you water them the first time you plant them. Well, what happens if you have two months and we have no rain? Yeah. Or we don't have much snow. You know, we've had winters where we have very little snow. So there's no moisture getting down there as those roots continue to grow. So I, I keep my hoses out as long as I can. And I will soak all the areas where I had planted bulbs. I soak my evergreens. I put the hose in really late, just before we get a hard freeze, because you want to make sure you've got moisture out there for not only your bulbs, but for your evergreens and some of your other plantings. So um, just make sure you water things in. Um, a couple of things I didn't talk about, and I know I'm going over here just about now, 11.30. This is a cute little bulb called Ithion, star flower, super easy to grow, um, and would be lovely, again, sprinkled in amongst um, yeah, um, things. Here's, here's kind of a typical Roy planting, right? This is Cesslaria autumnalis. And I kind of took some out of this to kind of show how Roy might plant it. You know, there's always going to be pockets, kind of that randomness. So here you've got these holes, right? If you can imagine, this is where you could plant pockets of bulbs. Go in amongst this Cesslaria and you could th put things like these Ithions. You could put in, um, he uses a lot, Allium Molly or Moly, M-O-L-Y, which um, I'm hoping we can get for you. Um, I think if there's things that you really, really want that we talked about today, just leave your name and say, I'd love to have a hundred of these and we'll see what we can do for you. But Starflower, um, easy to grow and they would just sprinkle into any perennial planting into grasses. To me, ornamental grasses and bulbs are just hand in hand because look how long it takes for grasses to emerge. Um, sometimes, you know, especially if you've got a big clump of panicum or miscanthus some, or, or um, even like Carl Forster, the Calamagrostis, you know, that's, it's going to be a while before that breaks dormancy. So there's another wonderful bulb that, um, that's on your handout, um, Camassia, I think it's on the front page. Yes, um, Camassia is a native bulb. We actually do have some native bulbs here. There's a couple of alliums that are native. Camassia is native to North America. It grows about three feet. It puts out a basal bunch of foliage that reminds me a lot of yucca. You know, it's got 45 degree angle, nice heavy foliage, sends up a beautiful tall spike of powder blue or, or bluish flowers with yellow pollen, and they bloom from the bottom up. And so they last, they bloom for almost three to four weeks, unless it gets super hot. And this is happening in May, uh, May to early June. So your grass is still sitting there like a big hummock, looking like nothing, right? Who wants to look at that until June? Why not plant bulbs around it? And camassias, I put a triangle, because the bulb is pretty big, I put a triangle around every hump of grass. And then you've got these beautiful camassia come up, great foliage, beautiful blue flowers, tall, and then by the time they're fading, the grass has come up and taken the spot. Excellent, you know, those kind of succession plantings that you can do. Uh, the same thing with alliums. You know, alliums are wonderful. They're your ornamental onions. And I'm sure you've seen them a lot. You know, many of you maybe grow um, Allium Summer Beauty. Now that's an herbaceous plant. You don't grow that as a bulb. 
Um, it's more, it's a perennial, um, the way the root system is on that, you're putting it in the ground as a plant. But there are all of these wonderful allium bulbs from the little tiny allium moly all the way up to uh, tall ones. Um, and these do like sun, however. Do not plant them in shade, all right? It can be the shade, um, a, a light bit of shade, but because these are blooming later, like in June and July, you cannot rely on waiting, you know, like the, a lot of the spring bulbs, they're done by the time the foliage comes out on the trees. So they, it doesn't matter with shade, but these guys, they're going to be blooming when the trees are out, so they need to have sun. Otherwise, they're just going to diminish. But alliums, your ornamental onions, are wonderful. And again, you don't have to worry about critters because they're onions. Unless you've got a deer that's really a connoisseur and loves their garlic-infused plants, they uh, will leave them alone. So these, uh, there's, there's a couple here. We have the Christophii, which is a big, loose, kind of softball size um, flower, which is just beautiful. Lovely to dry, yeah. Yeah. you know, you can, when the flower fades, just dry them and put them in a vase. You don't have to spray them with gold glitter if you don't, you, know, you can just, which some people, you can just keep them plain. Um, and then Allium, this one is Miami, which is kind of an interesting, it's kind of looks like a cross from Atropurpurium. Um, so um, Alliums are wonderful for that summertime bloom. You know, you've got all your other bulbs in the spring. This carries you into summer with all of the different alliums, um, so they can be wonderful. Now there are a couple of bulbs that will take wet soils. If you want to plant near a pond um, or near a, a swale, uh, there's actually three. There's um, the camassia that I was talking about will take moist soils. The thing about camassia, it'll grow in sun, it'll grow in shade, it'll grow in wet, it'll grow in dry. It's like It'll tolerate clay soils. Um, then there's uh, Leucogem, L-E-U-C-O-J-U-M. I think it's on your handout, too. Um, they look very much like this Galanthus. It's a little nodding white flower. However, this is only maybe six inches tall. Leucogem are about 30 inches tall. They're blooming in May. And guess what? Ding, ding, ding. They are in the Amaryllis family, which means... Nothing will eat them. That's the same, the foliage looks just like daffodils in a way, but then they send up these spires of white, pendulous, little white blooms with little green nibs. Um, these have, this, the snowdrop is three long petals, three short petals, where the leucogem, or the, they're called um, snowflakes, uh, summer snowflakes, they're the same length of a petal, but they're glorious, and they bloom for the longest time, and they will take damp, wet soils. They'll grow in dry soil too, but they'll tolerate wet soil. And then there's one other, the little uh, guinea hen flower, the little Fritillaria meleagris, which should be on your handout. Mm -hmm. It's called a checkerboard Fritillary, it. and it has, it will tolerate, like, it's beautiful for, like, moist meadows uh, in tall grass. Um, you can pop those bulbs in there, and they'll all take moisture. Mm -hmm. It's a fall crocus. Mm -hmm. It starts to see... Colchicum. Colchicum? Yeah. What do you think of those? Fantastic. Colchicum send up a huge mass of leaves in the spring. Here's all this foliage. The foliage fades away. Kind of an ugly death because it's big and heavy foliage. Turns yellow, but you have to just wait. So again, chuck it into things. Then in fall, Late, well, actually, late summer. It gets to be like August, September. There's one that blooms actually into October. They send up their blooms. Um, they will be starting, I can guarantee you, there's a section at the Botanic Garden that they're probably just emerging. So you get these beautiful blooms in the fall with no leaves. Optimal time to plant fall bulbs to me is September, October. You can still do it in November, but you're, it's, you're fighting yourself. It's just trying to get that hole dug. Um, so people say, well, if I plant it too early, the weather's nice, won't it start to grow? Not really, it's gonna grow roots. So you really don't have to worry about it. Just make sure you plant them good and deep. Um, there's also another wonderful fall bulb that many of you might've seen here uh, at, <laughs> at, at, at Northwind in years is Lycoris. It's called the resurrection lily. Ah. Again, it sends up foliage in the spring. 
dies down and then sends up. They bloomed, they're done blooming now. They're blooming more like in August. Um, tall, beautiful pink tubular blooms that the hummingbirds love. Um, and um, so that's another lovely um, fall surprise, late summer surprise. I plant them all the time with hostas. They come up and they look like, you know, somebody will say, oh my God, I've never seen a hosta bloom like that. Well, it's, it's the Lycoris. So most of your bulbs, when you get them, there's like these will have a little stick or you can look it up on the internet. It'll tell you how to space them. So daffodils, because this is such a big bulb, in the hole, I would probably space them, you know, maybe five, six inches apart. Okay, so you could dig a pretty big hole and put five or six of these in here about this far apart. You don't need to put them super close because they're going to get bigger and bigger. So I would put them about this far um, away from each other. Now your little tiny bulbs, I don't really worry about that too much. I just dig a hole and maybe put five in the bottom of the hole. And then maybe dig another hole over here and put five. Okay, so those you're spacing pretty close together and you're doing clumps of them. Um, is that helping to answer your question? Yeah. Now let's say you do have a bed outside your front door and you want to put a little bit more of a large mass of, let's say, daffodils. You know, maybe you have a spot that's kind of where you put annuals and you want to have just a real, or you're doing it for a, a job site and you want to have either tulips or daffodils. What I do in that case, I dig out the whole bed. I take a tarp, lay it over here, I dig the whole bed. And even if it's a, you know, three, to, three by three, you don't want to have to, instead of doing all those individual holes, if it's just soil, dig it all down to the proper depth. Okay, and you can, this is other trick. Let's say you want to put, you don't have to put only one type of bulb. You could put daffodils and crocus. You could put daffodils and muscaris. So you got the daffodil flower up here and you got the grape hyacinths underneath. It's beautiful. Double them up. So then you dig your hole and let's say it's a big hole or it's, and then lay those bulbs all out. I kind of go through and I make the, you know, like a, a anybody play dominoes? Mm -hmm. Okay, you got the five. So you put one, two, three, four, five. That's how you lay them out so they're not in rows. That way they're off center. So one, two, three, four, five. And you just lay them out that way. Then you come and put your soil on top. Now what you can do, now let's say it's daffodils. They're down there eight inches, right? Now let's say you want to put muscaris with them or psilocybirica, a little bulb. Now you lay your soil down to where it's only four inches, sprinkle those out in there. Then put your final soil on, and now you've planted two layers of bulbs. Easy peasy. Up come the daffodils and the muscaris. You've got this beautiful layered effect, and it's fantastic. You can do that even in the individual hole. If you dig a, you know, a two-foot hole, go down eight inches, plant daffodils, put some soil on top, plant some muscaris, add your rest of your soil, you've got double beauty. But and then snaking them into your existing perennials. Come back in spring and see how Roy, you know, there's, if you go out and look at the Cecilaria or the Sporobolus, there's usually bulbs sprinkled through. And that's just, you know, you don't have to have a, a solitary bed. You can look at your existing places. Where do I have grasses? Where do I have hostas? Where do I have daylilies? And just sprinkle bulbs in. Questions, but thank you so much. Thank it's you. Uh, so wonderful to gather and talk about plants, isn't it? There's just not much better. Thank you all.